What is going on, everyone? It's Sean from All Things EV, and this is a continuation of a conversation with my friend Ravi Kampaya. Ravi, welcome back to my channel. Well, Sean, thank you so much. Uh, I consider it an honor because uh, in the last six months, you have done some absolutely incredible interviews. I've learned so much from you through those interviews, and it's an absolute pleasure to be part of this series. Thank you. I Thank you. That that's that's super kind of you. And uh, we we've we've actually had some interactions since the last conversation we had back in May. Uh, you were out in Halifax, Nova Scotia, attempting several Guinness Book of World Records. Can you just give the viewers a little bit of insight into what happened and what the end result was? Sure. Well, and and first of all, thanks for being there. And you know, your presence made a lot of difference. The goal was to. Um, highlight the efficiency of EVs. So to do that, we um, and basically, you know, I did a 24 hour um, lap, a continuous lap around on the racetrack on an e-bike. And we did about 1500 laps, uh, equaling close to 400 miles. And the cost of traveling 400 miles on an e-bike um, especially the cost of electric electricity was less than 75 cents. And that shows the, the efficiency of um, small EVs like e-bikes. So we put together a good team. My friend Pushkar was there, my friend Paula, you, and then of course, Professor Jeff Don, who is a, you know, who's, who's done amazing things in this space. So we were fortunate to have him. And overall, we were able to set a new record and, uh, uh, um, highlight the efficiency of EVs. So that was a fun and uh, very rewarding experience overall. But that's not all you do. So why don't you tell people who haven't seen our first conversation, you should go check it out if you haven't. It's, it's a two hour, really in-depth conversation. Um, what do you do today? And 2020 should be really big for you. So if you can share some of the things that are upcoming, uh, that would be fun as well. Sure, sure. Well, I'm a, I'm a finally a PhD student at the University of Illinois working on uh, advanced battery materials. Basically, I use uh, uh, quantum mechanical tools and computational tools to understand cathode materials and how, how can we design next gen materials? What are the properties one need, the, the materials need to have and how to overcome some of the existing challenges? So I work on specifically lithium uh, and manganese oxide um, cathodes and uh, I should, I'm hoping to graduate in August and move to Halifax. That will be a big transition. And I hope to be in the battery space for a foreseeable future because I think this is important. Uh, and it is really exciting to see the changes that is happening. So I'm excited to see what 2020 brings in. And I hope, uh, I hope you continue to do the same that you're doing. You're, uh, you know, your channel has been an absolutely incredible source of information. So I hope you continue doing some of these absolutely f fascinating interviews and reports. Great. Thank you. Well, we're going we're gonna to dive into uh, part two of our conversation about the electric vehicle market and more specifically batteries. So I want to kick it over to you because you've prepared some slides and I'll occasionally interject with some questions that I think might be helpful to those that are watching this. So, Ravi, go ahead and take it away. Sure, thank you. And you know, this time what I did is I made sure all the references are on the bottom of the slide itself so people can quickly look for it and go into it and make sure they can understand themselves. So I'm going to share the screen. Well, I wanted to start off uh, just with this data that I saw on Twitter. Um, you know, what we have witnessed in the last nine to 10 years is absolutely mind blowing. I mean, what would take a couple of decades, many decades, you know, we are able to witness that in a very short span of time, the growth, especially, uh, you know, if you take the example of Tesla, right, there was no car, a roadster on the market, on the road until 2020, 2012, when they officially launched it, um, it was available to the customers. But within a short span of time, about seven years, the kind of, of progress they have made is absolutely stunning. And that has spurred so much interest in the market. Uh, there are so many new EVs now, big players are jumping into the market. I'm excited for Rivian, Volkswagen, Tesla Semi, 
and I'm also very ex uh, interest, uh, interested in uh, seeing how, especially, uh, hold on a sec. Okay, yeah. You know, what I found really interesting was this slide by a gentle by, gentleman, a scientist by name Lex Friedman. He has amazing podcasts about deep learning and machine learning AI. He put out this slide showing how autopilot hardware is uh, gathering data on a daily basis uh, in the last few years. And I think this is gonna make a huge difference uh, in, in the coming decade for, uh, because every day, all this hardware on the mark on the road in our cars is gathering data and, they're, and they're refining their machine learning algorithm is refining it and the neural net net, net uh, is is uh, it's re, uh, relearning the whole thing. So uh, the full self driving capability and autopilot will be extremely impactful and it will continue to improve. And I think this is going to be exciting, very exciting for 2020 to 2029. And uh, I also wanted to just quickly mention uh, some important stuff that happened in the last decade. One is especially the fact that uh, inventors of lithium ion battery, Professor Goodenough, Professor Whittingham, and then Professor Yoshino received the 2019 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. It is a true testimony that it is not just the academic researchers, but the whole world and the bigger market is recognizing this is a pivotal moment, right? So I wanted to acknowledge that. And commercial, you know, and then other uh, analysts like Bloomberg, they think this year, 2020 to 2029, will be the most promising for mass adoption of EVs and will be the most impactful. And I, I agree because we are at a point, um, what people call a tipping point, where the cost of lithium ion batteries, right? You know, if you look at this slide, this is by this is a this is a infographic by an analyst by name Christoph Pillow. He runs a, this company, consultancy company, and the chart shows that in 2020, the cost of just the cathode cell, or the sorry, the anode and the, the whole cell, lithium-ion cell, right? It's just below 100. But if you add, you know, depreciation, R&D cost, sales, and overhead, and all that, probably it may go up to 150. But in, in a, at a larger scale, like at a place like Giga Factory, right, the cost is like 100 or less. So I think this is what people call as the tipping point, and we are that, right at that point. So it's only going to be extremely interesting moving forward. So, what do you think of this? Do you think uh, do you agree with the, the fact that 20 this decade is going to be extremely impactful? It it really appeal, appears like the the electric vehicle market is picking up some momentum, that's for sure. Um, I'm, I'm hearing and seeing often people who don't really have an interest in, in the environmental piece end up experiencing a, an electric car, and they end up really liking it a lot. And, and so um, I think that that's only bound to happen more often. I'm very curious to hear how some of these implementations that Tesla will likely make here in 2020 I'm, I'm curious to see how that impacts the overall cost of, of batteries, if that drives it down below $100 per kilowatt hour and, and what that will do to the, to the cost of, of electric vehicles and, and the electric vehicle market. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's going to be exciting and it's going to be challenging for, too for other um, automakers to step up and then do the same kind of thing that Tesla has done. But it's going to be really exciting and uh, glad to be part of it. Uh, so moving forward, and I just wanted to give a quick overview of the lithium ion battery materials so people who are watching this can be aware of what we are talking about. Uh, so what we see on the left corner here is the schematic of a proper lithium ion battery 18650, where we have current collector, graphite anode, separator, porous separator, there's a cathode and the current collector, right? And what matters, you know, this this is the general structure for almost every battery, whether it is phone, electric car, whether it is laptop, whatever it is, it is a general general architecture. What changes from one material or one device to another is most of the time it is a cathode and some electrolyte. For example, this is Nissan Leaf, one of the largest selling EVs in the world. 
and they use a material called LMO, lithium manganese oxide, spinel manganese oxide. And the spinels can also be in titanium, but they don't use them, they use manganese. And there's a company in China called BYD, which is huge, and Warren Buffet owns a huge uh, portion of that company. And um, they use a material called lithium iron phosphate, which is a little bit low energy density, but really robust and you know, lasts quite long. So they use that. And, and in Tesla Model 3 or Model S, we have a layered composite material called NCA. If you look at it, basically it's layered, right? And between the layers, you have these green dots or balls, which are lithium atoms. This is a schematic. So you have, this is nickel. One, two, three, four, five. Oops, sorry. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight part nickel, one part cobalt, so one part cobalt and one part manganese. So this is called NMC 811 chemistry. Eight nickel, one cobalt, one manganese. And if you change that to, if you bring in two cobalt and two manganese, then it will be 622 chem, you know, 622 architecture. But what uh, it's NCA is very similar. You know, it's just that it has a, um, instead of a, um, manganese, it has aluminum, but it's a very similar structure, um, layered structure. And what we see on the, uh, in iPhone is basically lithium cobalt oxide, a very similar layered structure too. So um, what's interesting is if you go to one side, lithium cobalt oxide, you get excellent rate capability. That's why people use it in the phones and small form factor, but you compromise on some of the other things. Uh, you know, um, for example, if you have really high nickel, you have pretty good energy density, but you compromise on safety. And then if you, so this is kind of a, you know, you need to get a balance to, um, to you know, you need to hit the sweet spot to be able to um, get the right parameters for an application. So this is the general architecture. And then one from one device to another, we change the cathode, right? And this is the pause current status. Current status is uh, graphite has about 360, the theoretical is about 360 milliampere per gram. For cathodes, it varies from 160 to 240 milliampere per gram. And with the right electrolyte, you have an EV or a phone. But- Do you know, sorry. let me ask you a question here. Do you know much about where Tesla is headed? Because my understanding is, is that they want to remove cobalt completely from, from the uh, formula. That's right. Um, their their material their cathode is, has uh, less than ten percent cobalt, and uh, they also use some silicon in their anodes, which we will talk in detail in the coming slides. But they're also thinking of removing nickel, but you know that's not going to happen in the near term. It's a longer term project. Um, removing nickel and then you will need a slightly different chemistry altogether. The whole electrolyte source becomes different so it's a that's a much harder problem but in the near term they're going to remove remove most of the cobalt and make, make it a high nickel content so you get high energy density but the problem they're working on is how do we not compromise on the safety part because nobody wants to compromise on the safety so as you push it to higher nickel with less cobalt you compromise on safety so that is something they're working on now. So pushing it higher to nickel, NCM811 or NCA, but still retain some of the safety part of it. So it's, it, is it just being replaced with more nickel or is there something else that they're going to add and replace of it? Um, the NCA already has very less cobalt. Uh, in fact, there was a paper that right, uh, which we discussed last time that you could literally remove cobalt and not have much impact. But there are some um, caveats to that. So uh, they can replace it with, uh, yes, basically it is going to be predominantly more nickel, higher nickel content. Understood. Thank you. And, uh, and so for anybody who's new to this, they can quickly, you know, we can quickly recap this. Basically, this is the architecture we just discussed. And basically what involves, what it involves is you have a current collector like copper, and then you coat uh, the electrode material on it, right? 
for example, for cathode, it is aluminum, and for anode, it's copper. And uh, so they decode it on, on the current collector, and then you have a separator, you have a negative electrode, positive electrodes, and then you make a sandwich out of it in the form of a jelly roll. Use, you know, kind of, it's, it, they, it, it goes into this jelly roll, and the negative tab and negative tab and the positive tab comes out. And then there's a step called formation step. In the formation step, uh, before filling in, oops, before filling in, uh, so they need to fill the electrolyte. That is, there is a step. Before they seal it out, they have to fill in electrolyte and that's formation step. And uh, this, this happens in a device like this. Um, you can, so basically the cell goes into a, inert atmosphere in a glow box atmosphere and then you see the cells here right they are filled with uh, electrolytes and then they seal it and then that goes into testing so this is the step right like from preparing the slurry of electrodes to putting it on the current collector making it into a jelly roll once a jelly roll you have this you know, top cap before you close the seal you put the electrolyte and then you have an 18650 or 21700 cell. So this okay. is, uh, I, you're showing this and, and I'm instantly, I'm instantly thinking about Tesla's acquisitions from last year with, with Maxwell. It appears that the pictures over uh, the top left is uh -huh. what Maxwell is fulfilling. The, Pictures over on the right is what high bar is fulfilling with this sort of automated piece of filling filling in the uh, the, the batteries with electrolytes and so on. So uh, I'm, my my mind is instantly going towards that. I'm sure that there's more in this process, but th th this seems to represent what <laughs> Tesla's acquisitions from last year. Well, you are absolutely right, and you're pretty per perceptive. In fact, that's exactly the reason why I put these two images to show. Uh, where the improvements could be. You're absolutely right. The, the Maxwell stuff will make a difference here. The high bar stuff is supposed to make, I have not you know, really studied the high bar system, but from what I've read from articles, they expert, their, their, their expertise is in uh, advanced and, and like quicker filling of electrolytes into this small cells. And they have autom autom automated, uh, their, their system apparently is faster and then uh, makes it, uh, uh, you know, you don't waste the material, basically. So uh, I think that's where Ibar is going to make a difference. And and I, I hope that drives down the cost because that's the whole point. So people can, you know, then the EVs will cost less and then it will be more affordable. So we'll see how that pans out for Tesla. I hope, you know, it works out well. Great. Uh, and uh, this is... Uh, uh, you know, they're constantly working on increasing the energy density, right? This is from the 2018 shareholders meeting. A nice channel called East Talk Channel put out this uh, cartoon. And, and Elon mentioned that um, in the near term, they can increase the energy density by 30 for 30%. And right after that, you know, in 2019, early 2019, they acquired Maxwell Technologies. But for the long term, if you really want to push it to 450 or 500 watt per kilogram, then there's one thing that is absolutely key, which without which you really can't push it beyond 400, 500, up to 500. That is lithium anode. So, you know, this is the current status, right? You have, let's say this is NMC811 cathode, and then you have a graphite anode. The energy density at the stack level is about 255 watt per kilogram. But then if you want to push it to 400, then you must increase. So basically, you not only decrease the volume of the cell by going to a lithium anode, um, you also increase energy density to 400. But there are so many challenges, challenges to do this. We are going to get into deeper and deeper into this topic. And that's where solid state batteries make it potentially make a difference. And then if you can remove this kind of cathode with like sulfur, lithium sulfur or lithium air, there were a couple of papers in the media this year, early last year, 2019, lithium air battery, lithium carbon dioxide. But you know that's uh, that's pretty difficult because in 2016, Department of Energy 
funded millions and millions of dollars into lithium oxygen chemistry, okay? And for 2020, in their agenda, lithium oxygen is not even in the list because, because of how difficult it is. So lithium oxygen for now, I think, is not focused because the people realize it's too difficult and it's too impractical as of now. But that would be the ultimate. I mean, you're practically doubling the energy density from 240 to 4, 500. That's like, but that's a pretty difficult thing. So anyway, to, to, but I think people are working on lithium metal and that's where solid state batteries will make a huge difference. And there's so much interest in solid state batteries, but also there's so much misinformation. So I hope together you and me, you know, we can discuss some of the intricacies of solid state batteries and go deeper into what's going on in the field of solid state batteries. I've got a question. So uh, on, on that last slide, or referring to that last slide, okay. when energy density increases, uh -huh. does, the, does the weight and the size of these batteries decrease? Are there, are there some, are there some th benefits that happen? Because I'm just trying to imagine as, as, as companies like Tesla and researchers from around the globe are looking to advance lithium batteries does are there, are there some are there some benefits as well to that because if if you're getting more power out of a single cell but it's also reducing the weight then it sort of seems like it would be like a like a, a double benefit exactly that's right you not only decrease the volume so basically in a given volume you can put in more active materials more cathode and anode and also you're bringing in materials that have intrinsically higher energy density right so you're intrinsically you're ex, you know expanding the the storage capability but at the same time you're decreasing the volume so it's like you're burning the candle from both sides on both ends um that's right uh, by the way sean i just want to make sure people are able to see the slides because i can see the slide you can see the slide but i want to make sure this the screen is being also shared with others right yes i believe so okay okay good um, so one of the so one of the problems of um, one of the issues for using lithium metal is the formation of dendrites, right? And this formation of dendrites lead to fire hazard, can short circuit the battery, release huge amount of energy in a very short span of time, leads to fire, and you already have organic liquid electrolyte, so it, it's just like you know it's it's raging fire. So that's the problem if you puncture one of these cells you're basically short circuiting the whole thing and it releases huge and a huge amount of energy to to prevent that kind of dendrite formation people want to use the uh, one of the one of the benefits of using solid electrolyte or solid what people refer to as solid state batteries basically you have solid uh, anode which is lithium metal and then solid electrolyte so everything is in solid phase. That's why people call solid state batteries. And I, I, one of the benefits of using solid state batteries, if, if done the right way, is it will minimize the growth of dendrites and short circuit, um, you know, um, pro, the, uh, the deleterious effect of uh, dendrites. So I have this nice video. This is the research done by University of Michigan's. Uh, uh, um, engineering school and they were able to put, make the cell uh, make a battery a small cell with glass was one of the components so basically they can see through what's going on you know they have a cathode and anode here and then they can put it under a microscope and observe what's going on so i'm going to play a quick video for just for a few seconds it's really fascinating at, at around two minutes 16 seconds mark they show what's going on, right? If you look at this, basically they can see how the dendrites go back and forth as you charge and discharge. And this is this is in liquid electrolyte, but if you bring in a solid electrolyte, basically the solid suppresses the growth of dendrites. And as a as a so the the solid electrolyte not only acts as an electrolyte, but also it acts as a separator, suppressing the movement, physical movement of the dendrites and uh, stop them from touching the cathode. So that's one of the expected benefits. 
and then this is uh, this is this this these two images are, are from uh, Professor Shirley Meng's group at the UCSD, and uh, this is a hybrid battery, hybrid solid state. Basically, you know the anode is basically still uh, graphite and carbon binder and all that, and uh, there is a cathode. It's but the solid electrolyte come you know touches or um, connects both of them. But in this case, it is lithium metal. Lithium metal for lithium metal has huge energy density, uh, specific energy. So you need a very small quantity. But if you use graphite, graphite is something called as a intercalation material. So if you go back to our previous slide, right? So this is called intercalation cell. Basically, the lithium intercalates into the graphite, and then it here is graphite. It intercalates into graphite, and it intercalates into cathode. But if you use lithium metal, you know you don't have to integrate because lithium itself, like it's a huge pure energy on its own. And uh, so, this is an interesting topic: solid state batteries or solid state electrolytes. How far are solid state batteries away from from being used in in cars? Uh, I've seen a few companies talk about, and I know we'll get to this in, in some future slides in detail, but um, uh, Fisker has talked about their Fisker emotion uh, as being a solid state. I know Toyota is talking about that, and some people are heralding it as as the next near near future technology for EVs. But my impression is that this technology is still several years out, five to 10 years out. Uh, and that it needs further testing and validation. You are absolutely right. You know, it's there's huge amount of effort and focus put into this area by researchers. Every university, if they're working on lithium uh, batteries, they have a group working on solid state electrolytes and batteries because you know people think people understand the importance of it. People understand the implications, but people also understand the challenges there are huge challenges right so the one of the benefits you know I, i'm just listing three of them one of them is the structure itself it acts as both as an electrolyte and a separator and as a result you need less volume of materials you don't have to you know share the space uh, to to separate keeps anode and cathode apart so basically you can make it more compact energy dense at the same time, the liquid electrolytes can decompose it if you run them at more than 4.5 volts. And that's why you know, a typical 18650 is limited to 4.2 volts. Some of them can go up to 4.4, but if you go beyond 4.5, they decompose and it leads to fire hazard. And these organic electrolytes are flammable. So that's, that's another problem. And then some of these solid electrolytes have very, um, very high resistance to uh, resistance to uh, to fire and they don't catch fire easily and they can op they can operate at higher temperatures for example you know you can let's say ideally you have a solid state battery you could probably keep your car uh, in in the hot arizona desert without having to have complex thermal cooling system because the electrolyte can still work at 100 degrees celsius right and uh, you can stack the cell closer into increase the volume. So see, these are some of the benefits. And this is a previous slide, we looked at the architecture for a typical lithium ion battery. This is a simple architecture for a solid state battery. In the middle, you have uh, uh, particles of solid electrolytes. You have anode on one side, oops, and cathode on the other side. You have to have nice amalgamation because if you have uh, abrupt interfaces, that's going to lead to terrible performance of the battery. So you see some solid electrolyte particles uh, in the anode and cathode to make it a seamless uh, mixture. So this paper is from, uh, you know, they were written by a couple of um, well-known researchers. In fact, one of them was the inventor of, uh, or the developer of lithium iron phosphate battery at MIT. And this is what people call, basically all solid state batteries can be put into one of these three categories. One is all solid state, as we discussed, lithium metal, solid state electrolyte, and then a solid cathode. The cathode also has 
solid state electrolyte you know interjected into that in their structure the hybrid will have basically you still retain some of the graphitic anode uh, transition metal you know lmo with a disnca or an mc cathode and you have um, solid state it's kind of a mixture right and then there's something called anode free basically there is no anode in the beginning but on the first charge the lithium goes from cathode and forms lithium metal on the other side um, so these are three architectures that most of these hot solid state batteries fall into and let's take a step further down and go deeper into how some of these things work the slide looks a little bit intimidating but we can go step by step and explain what's going on here you know, it, 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 this gives an um, idea of the, the amount of work that is being done by the scientific community. Also, the complexity of the problem, because it's quite complex problem. You know, you can't simply throw million dollars at this and then get results out of it, because it's a very hard scientific problem. So what we are seeing is basically all kinds of, you know, just this one material solid state electrolyte magnified here, right? And that's what we are seeing here. There are many different kinds. What is called as amorphous, you know, it's SPE means solid polymer electrolyte. There are amorphous polymers, there are crystalline polymers. So you have um, amorphous polymers um, like PO, PDF, PMMA, and then uh, if you have crystal, crystalline, basically you also have lithium salt added to the, some of these amorphous polymers to make it conductive to get the right kind of performance. And then there are famous uh, inorganic solid electrolytes, which comprise of sulfides, oxides, and nitrites. And the reference is here. People can you know, go to this paper and read more about it. And basically sulfides comprise of you know, lithium, germanium, phosphorus, sulfide. It's called as LGPS in the community. And then you have uh, lysicon, which is lithium, zinc, germanium oxide. It's, um, it's, it's lithium aluminum, germanium phosphide, phosphide um, and, and uh, perovskites. These are all crystalline oxides. This is called LLZO. The LLZO looks like this. I got it from this paper. So basically what we are seeing LLZO here, lithium, lanthanum, zirconium oxide, garnet, can be seen here. Like it's in the, there are different kinds, but it's a semi-transparent solid, and uh, this this falls into oxide category, and then you have nitrites. There's something called CSE, which is composite solid electrolytes. Basically, you take some of these polymer electrolytes and make a composite with, you know, you use either inorganic solid electrolytes or some other non-lithium based you know, stuff like titanium oxide, zirconium oxide, make a composite out of it, and you have a conductive solid, composite solid electrolytes. And each one of them have 100 to 1000 papers written on it, several PhDs, hundreds of PhD students working on each one of them. Now that's like three to four years of work, right? So you understand the gamut and the complexity of the problem we're speaking about here. And, you know, for example, this one, LGPS, lithium, germanium, phosphorus, sulfide, is a material that was, trying, you know, pushed very heavily by Toyota. We are going to get into that material, uh, show a little, go deeper into that material. But um, this, this gives an idea of how much work is being done by the research community into solid state batteries. And there are so many challenges for each one of them. For example, the polymers, PEO, for example, the Ziploc bag is polyethylene, but um, you, I'm pretty sure we have seen, you know, plastic boxes, right? Plastic containers, they have PEO in them and they're flexible. So you have one uh, solid electrolyte which is flexible, but the other stuff, Garnet and then NLZO, are not, they're not flexible. These are pretty strong, but these have higher conductivity, uh, lithium conductivity, better than polymer, but they don't have the flexibility. And then, you know, there are others which have some of the good conductivity, but you can't cycle them for hundreds of cycles. But to be able to put it in a commercial application, you need thousands of cycles, not hundreds. 
So the cycling uh, problems, and then as you cycle them, the, the, some of the structure changes. So I, I, this slide you know, captures the complexity of the problem. And it is not just, you know, that's why this material is pretty hard to make it into commercial application. It may, but I really don't know what will happen and how long it will take. I'm pretty sure it'll be five years or more because the cost is, if you can get all of this, let's say you got the flexibility, you got the conductivity, you got somehow you were able to get the cycle life, but the cost will be exorbitant. You know, who wants to pay like thousand dollars per kilowatt hour when you can get an, you know, uh, for a hundred dollars per kilowatt hour on a lithium battery. So that makes it prohibitive. So it's a, that's why it's a bit of a complex, not a bit, it's a, it's a heavily complex problem. So it's not just that the technology is out there and available, but probably more importantly, it's that it's commercially available at an affordable cost to be able to put into, for example, electric vehicles. That's exactly right. You know, to make one prototype is one thing. You can probably get decent cyclability, decent flexibility, decent conductivity, all of that. But to be able to make that in thousands and millions is a different ball game. You know, I can make some of these, for example, when lit so we are gonna get into this material like lithium, germanium, phosphorus, sulfide. This, so let's see, I think it's the next slide, but it will come soon. So this material was actually uh, developed heavily by Toyota back in 2010, okay? And it is still yet to make commercial application, 2011. They, they put out this paper in 2011, all right? And it is barely making it into the commercial application now. And it's a big powerhouse like Toyota who have billions of dollars at their disposal for take seven eight years to even make it into a small commercial application you know it, it gives you the sense of difficulty in making you know attacking this problem yeah so solid state is a nice headline grabber uh when 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 these media outlets and even youtubers talk about solid state but there's a lot of other things to factor in uh you know i mentioned i mentioned the, the commercial cost effectiveness but I, I would say also safety as well is one of those things that has to be validated too you don't want to put something into a vehicle with thousands of these batteries and and have something go wrong you're absolutely right in fact that was one of the conclusions from this paper they said well it, it is a potential solution to a problem important problem the validation of the safe, you know safety criteria cyclability and then you know is the safety good you know safety is one thing at the beginning but is it going to be safe after 700 cycles or 1000 cycles so you know how can you assess the safety at 700 cycles or 1000 cycles without running it for 700000 cycles uh, and you know so in fact one of the uh, contribution by professor jeff don was something called High precision colorimetry basically what would take 10 years you could probably get the result in a much shorter time because you know if you if you can only learn something by cycling it for 10 years that's unrealistic yes so yeah that's correct the, the problem with one of the another one of the issues bigger issues with solid state batteries is the um, issue of interfaces right there are multiple interfaces in solid state batteries. And I, I wanted to share this small quote by Wolfgang Pauli, who was one, was one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics. He said, God made the bulk, but surface was created by the devil, which, which means to show that the complexity at the surface. So when you bring in solid state batteries, you have solid electrolyte and cathode state interface, and then cathode and then carbon additives interface and then the current collector and then cathode interface, current collector and carbon, current collector and solid electrolytic interface. So lithium has to have impeccable diffusivity through all these interfaces. You need to improve many of these, um, make sure the interface is conducive for lithium transport at a fast rate. So, you know, when you flow the pedal, gas pedal, it is able to give that energy that means you know lithium is trying to pass through all kinds of interfaces here. So the more interfaces you have, 
the, the harder the problem gets. So this is by the paper, Understanding Interface Stability in Solid State Batteries in, in a pretty prestigious journal. The people can go into to this journal paper and then read more about it. But basically you, you need to solve, now this is a coated, basically you can coat some of the cathode materials and then mix it with uh, solid state batteries, a particle, solid electrolyte particles. And you still need to ensure the contact is good because if the contact is not good, then it leads to a hot spot. It's like a tiny hot spot that can grow and grow and then lead to catastrophic failure. So, so that's the problem that anyway, the interface is, this is something they must um, solve. And then the issue of, for example, this, the, some of these oxides ha are pretty stiff, brittle actually, I would say brittle and then stiff, right? So if it is um, very brittle, brittle, then how are you gonna make a cylindrical cell? Or maybe you just need to make a pouch, flat pouch cell and make sure there is no um, inadvertent, inadvertent pressure on these kind of batteries. Um, basically, you know, if, if it is, if the battery is a little bit compliant mechanically, that's good because it gives it this the kind of toughness. But if it is too brittle, then it, that can lead to, uh, that can become a failure point on its own because if one, brittle fracture can lead to a, a isolated region which could lead to uh, all kinds of problems. So to summarize the issue of interfaces, you know, let's put the, those two things together. This is from the same paper. You have, we have bulk interfaces. At the bulk interfaces, you need to solve the problem of porosity. Different materials have different density. And then you need to make sure the, you know, the, the seamless mixture. You need to make sure there are no confined pathways. Um, for example, lithium should have sufficient sites to go from one site to the other. If it is all concentrated in one point or you know, other point, then it can lead to uh, imbalance and that could be a failure point. It has to be uniformly you know, going back and forth and the whole interface has to have uh, right kind of porosity, density of materials, pathway should be existent along the whole surface. So that's at the bulk level. And then at the surface level, you have chemical instabilities. You, the, the, these interfaces need to match up chemically also. If, if they don't match up chemically, if one of them has a tendency to undergo oxidation or reduction at the surface, then that's not good because then it could lead to, you know, for example, sulfide, sulfide based solid electrolytes have a um, tendency to release H2S gas, which is not good. And that is at the surface. And then at the interface, many of, at the many of these small interfaces, right, between the particles, between the electrolyte, between the electrode, you need to make sure that there, there are no drastic volume changes at high temperature as the cell starts working at high temperature it should not lose conductive pathways so then it just you know then if the loop if let's say because of high temperature one of them expands rapidly and lose loses contact with other uh, interface then you lose this pathway where now lithium cannot go to the other side because because of um, excessive volume change and then there's something, so bulk, right? We spoke about bulk, at the bulk you have porosity, for example, if you use polymer, then they should have the right kind of porosity, density, crystalline structure at the surface. There should not, there should not be any inadvertent oxidation reduction or the other chemical reaction at the surface interface, you need to have the right kind of contact. And then you have something called grain boundary. You know, um, a single crystal is better than polycrystalline because the more boundaries you have, tougher it gets. And th that's why single crystal is better. And then there's something called grain boundary resistance, space charge effect. So there are so all these things to tackle for um, at different levels from bulk to grain boundary. And it, you have to solve all this, whether it is a polymer electrolyte or an inorganic solid electrolyte, you have to solve problems at all these uh, time length scales. So that is why it's a hard problem. It is taking so much time. And one great example is Toyota. 
you know, as you know, Toyota, right? They have been making a lot of news and they're supposed to release their solid state battery this year at the Tokyo Olympics sometime in August. And this is something they have been talking from 2011, right? When Tesla came into existence, they didn't, this is the only EV that had not put out this, and this one probably um, Honda, um, but they have not put out a single pure battery electric vehicle. They have lots of hybrids. They have Mirai, which is a fuel cell car, but there is no pure electric vehicle. And they're supposed to show showcase this. This is Lexus LS30, and it has, apparently this has pure solid state. In fact, they also, the prototype shows that the, the marking it, on, the, on the door threshold, it says solid state. So this goes back to 2011. In 2011, they, they developed this material called LGPS, lithium germanium phosphorus sulfide. And at that time, it was pretty remarkable because it had 12 millisiemens per centimeter at room temperature, whereas the organic liquid electrolytes have about 10, 10 to 20. So basically what it, it is, is a, you can look at this material as a huge building with multiple hundreds of rooms. And then there are hallways which are open for lithium to move. So this lithium can traverse from one end to the other end because there are, there's a um, open pathway or, you know, in, in, or in a building, long one directional hallways, right? Um, that is really conducive for lithium transport. So they published this uh, paper called a lithium super ionic conductor and they proceeded to develop more on it. In 2016, they improved upon it. So they had lithium silicon phosphorus sulfide with some carbon on it. And that had a remarkable conductivity, ionic conductivity of 25 millisiemens per centimeter. Um, that is remarkable for a solid electrolyte. So as you can see, this is the skeletal structure. And then within the skeleton, you have lithium. The green structure shows where lithium can go. So you can see long pathways, which, which provides um, wonderful um, con connected pathway for lithium to go from one side to the other. So that's why they call it like super ionic conductor for lithium. And they show what this graph shows is all solid state battery here. For example, supercapacitors can have really high power density, but their energy density is very low. Okay. Uh, but you need to have what this is a Ragon pl plot, and this plot shows where you need to have your energy and power densities. So on one side, you have supercapacitors with really high power density, but low energy density. You need to cross this line, right? Red, oops, red line. You need to have both energy density and power density to be able to you know, use it as a EV battery. So what we are using, you know, lithium ion batteries is right around this point here. Their prototypes showed solid state batteries with really high um, power density and also very decent energy density. But the problem is again, we discussed the cost. At what cost? You know, is it $1,000 per kilowatt hour, $2,000 per kilowatt hour? Can you, not only the cost, let's say somehow Saudi Arabia said, well, we are going to invest trillion dollars into this and make it happen. But is it possible to manufacture millions of tons or thousands of metric tons of this material? That is another question, right? So they have done some amazing work. And even though they started doing it in 2011, it is barely making it into commercial applications now. So it gives you an idea of how complex this problem is. Why, why, why do you think that Toyota has sort of conceded on, on electrification uh, as, as we know it today. I believe both Toyota and Honda have made public announcements about how they don't believe electrification is the way of the future. Is it possibly because they're behind the scenes trying to develop the, the solid state battery? 
I think so. They wanted to make sure there is no um, fire hazard associated with these batteries. And by nature, they take a very conservative approach. They don't go all out into one thing. They want to make sure that everything is set before they put in million, billions of dollars into it. In fact, I'm pretty sure they have put in significant amount of money into solid state battery development and other stuff. But it still perplexes me why they would put money into hydrogen fuel cell, but not into electric lithium ion battery electric vehicle. Um, but as you said, they were for sure they were working on all kinds of things in the background, whether it is solid state um, bat electrolytes or even lithium ion. But I think they are trying to hold off, make sure everything is kind of, you know, uh, foolproof before they can jump all in. But why, why do you think, do you, you know, you have spoken with some of the you know, CEOs and people really who are leading some of these companies. What is your insight into this? I don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's a lot of speculation at this point in terms of where, where the future is. I have a lot of ideas in my head, but uh, none of them that I can say are, are, are formulated to, to, um, you know, talk knowledgeably about. I, you know, I, I, I do wonder why, why some of these Japanese automakers are, are not moving a little bit more swiftly towards or away from the internal combustion engine and, and towards electrification. Is it, is it because they know that they've got a, a solid state battery that's less than five years away? Or is it because they really believe that the internal combustion engine is still superior? I don't know. In the meantime, <laughs> companies like Tesla are, are um, com companies like Tesla are, are gaining market share, automotive market share and, and doing it, it seems like incredibly fast. Yes, you know, for Toyota and Honda, it is not just bringing these electric vehicles into the market. They will also be cannibalizing their own present vehicles, right? They don't want to sacrifice their, their present um, profitability um, to, to promote something that is not fully established. So they would take that into consideration. And as you said in one of the videos, Tesla has nothing to lose. They, they, might, they will go all in because that is their only plan A. There is no plan B. If it mm -hmm. fails, then they have to make it work. I think it's you or Matt who, who is mentioning this. Um, but for Toyota and Honda, you know, they have plan A, B, C, D, E, F. So, you know, and at the same time, they have to feed 60, maybe 100,000 employees and they have to give them bonuses. They have to give them raises, you know. So they have to take all of that into consideration before putting in all their resources. And actually, <laughs> um, so there is an example of, I'll come to that uh, story of Dyson, right? I will talk about it. Uh, what happened to Dyson, who put in a lot of money and effort into it, and then they just got out of the market this year. So anyway, to s summarize the solid state battery, I put this slide together. So what we are seeing on the left is a commentary by Professor Mandiram, who is actually a colleague of Professor Goodenough. In fact, he worked with, he was, he was a postdoc with Professor Goodenough, and he became a professor at UT Austin. And in and the Nobel Prize ceremony this year, it was Professor Mandiram who gave the speech um, because Professor Goodenough was not on a, you know, he was on a wheelchair and he didn't want to stand there for 45 minutes. So, he wrote a paper about solid state batteries and this is what he comments, okay? The improved reliability of all solid state lithium ion batteries makes them appealing for large scale applications. However, for all solid state lithium ion batteries with inorganic solid state electrode, electrolytes, key challenges remain, such as the volume change in the electrodes, interfacial charge transfer resistance, flexibility concerns, and poor cycle, cycling stability. Solid polymer electrolytes overcome some of the limitations of the inorganic solid electrolytes, that is, they have no good flexibility and contact with the electrodes, but they have narrow electrochemical stability windows and low ionic conductivity at room temperature, which currently impede the development of polymer-based 
So, and then they share this table where they highlight the advantages and the disadvantages for each one of them. You know, previously we showed a big um, picture, um, kind of a collage that talked about oxides, sulfides, hydrides, halides, thin film, polymer, all that, right? For each one of them, they highlight what is the advantage, what is the disadvantage. For example, if you look at the polymer, it has flexible, stable with lithium metal. It is flexible. It is easy to produce. You know, polymers have been around for many years and people know how to make them. But limited thermal stability, low oxidation voltage, and uh, some of the sulfides have low oxidation stability, sensitive to moisture, poor compatibility, and many of them have cycling. For example, they may not sustain thousands of cycles. And then and they've not considered the cost. Some of these materials can be pretty expensive to make in large scale. That goes to our next point, which is they will still be used in some key applications like you know RFIDs, medical devices, and and you know energy harvesting and you know and wearables. Wearables are a big thing in the current market, a Fitbit, Apple Watch, all kinds of stuff. So there is an and drones. So there will be some applications which will still use in small quantities, but for bigger applications like EV, there is no other way. You have to overcome some of the other challenges because you know when you're transporting three, four people or hundred people, safety is a huge thing. If you have an RFID at this small scale, even if it catches, you know, if something goes wrong, it may not lead to a huge fire like an EV does because Basically, you know, in, at, a, at that scale, you're sitting on a potential bombshell, you know. So, so they need to make sure it is absolutely safe. So that leads us to Dyson. It is a very interesting story, right? Back in 2015, this article is from 2015. Dyson acquired solid-state battery startup called Shakti out of University of Michigan, and they produce they acquired that for 90 million dollars and then they start in 2017 they're putting pumping in billions of dollars into their venture which is to make electric car and but in 2018 it looks like solid state batteries becoming less likely and what we see in 2019 is a sad story after so much effort hundreds of people spent several years into this they put in two billion dollars into this and then they completely scrapped the project and they said they don't want to take this hit anymore because the, what we discussed in the last 20 minutes the complexity of the project different materials getting the cost getting the cyclability getting the safety in a commercial at a commercial scale is a humongous challenge so it goes to show even big names like dyson who had the financial and technical wherewithal couldn't make it uh, couldn't make it happen so no wonder Tes no, tesla is not using them because they understand the challenges otherwise i'm pretty sure tesla is testing all kinds of solid state materials but um they stuck with what they knew lithium ion batteries so shall we go to the next topic or do we have any other questions or you know no. discussions no i think it's a really great overview of solid state uh the, the layman summary is they're not ready yet for, for mass production of, of electric vehicles. Uh, 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 right now it looks like that, yes. And uh, I was, uh, you know, out of, out of my curiosity a few months ago, I was researching why Model 3 uses 21700 instead of 16, 18650s, right? So I came across this very interesting paper. Energy density of cylindrical lithium ions as a comparison of commercial 18650 to 21700s. So basically, what they summarize is that by going from 18650 to 21700, the energy density, which is which is watt hour per liter, does not increase by much. But there are other benefits. For example, cell resistance goes down consider considerably. So, so Sean, you have a model S, right? What is the mm -hmm. up, uh, upper uh, charge limit that it can take like 150 kilowatt, kilowatts or 200 kilowatts? It's been a little while since I've charged it to 100%, but probably around 240, 240 miles. No, no, no. The charging rate. 
I think it is 150 or 200 kilo, kilowatts, right? Oh, the charge rate, sorry. Uh, yeah, it doesn't get above 120 kilowatt charge rate. Yeah, but you know, some of the Model 3 is uh, rated at 250 kilowatts, right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. For the next level advanced charges. And I was wondering why that could be. There are multiple factors that go into why Model 3 has at, you know, such higher fasting, fast, fast rates Whereas more or less, even the latest one, I think it's still um, got around 200 kilowatts. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so we are going to go into this slowly, step by step. So the, the cell resistance, as we go from 18650 to 21700, goes down. So the red squares, that's for 21700, and the black triangle is 18650. As you can see, with the discharge energy at higher what hours? It is 21,700 that has low resistance, whereas some of the 18650s have much higher resistances, like you know, with, on the order of uh, 20 to 25 milliohms per cell. And uh, the reason is now, as you, if you look at it, um, the surface area available for the cathode in 21,700 is higher. As a result. Um, you can pump in more lithium. You know, it's easy. So you have basically you have increased um, surface uh, area of the cathode by going into you know like 21 millimeter um, jelly roll size, and also because it is this is 70 right? Sorry, it's 70 millimeter in length and 21 in the diameter. So also you can put in more jelly rolls. In 21 millimeter diameter. So they did all very interesting tests. For example, they measured the surface temperature at different charge rates. See, it, it's a we can Coulomb rate or charge rate, and they found that interestingly, um, 1860, 1860s have lower temperature surface temperature. And you would think that higher surface temperature of the 21700 is a little bit disadvantageous. But if you look at this graph, it shows that, no, I think, sorry, there's someone, one other graph, maybe I didn't put that. Basically, uh, 21700s have a much higher discharge capacity and they can store more. In fact, um, if it is, so I think the, it's about 20, 3.5 amp hour for 18650, whereas this one, 21700, goes up to 4.85 amp hours. So you have um, higher um, energy storage um, going from 18650 to 21700, but the density, the density doesn't increase much. What This is what that graph shows. The specific energy um, is highly, it's also dependent on the anode coating thickness. But as you, you see, the 18650s and 21700s are, are on par. They go hand in hand. So by increasing the coating thickness, you know, um, there's not appreciable increase in specific energy. In fact, if you make the, the electrodes very thick, it takes longer and it's more difficult for lithium to diffuse and then you increase the ohmic losses. So they put together a slide summarizing what they found out. The main benefit cost reduction comes from the fact that you have, you need lesser housings. So for example, if you to get, let's say if you want to get, uh, let's say 50 watt hours of energy, you may need 50 or maybe 100 watt hours of energy. Let's take 100 watt hours of energy. Let's say you need, for that you need 24 18650 cells, but you only need 16 21,700 cells. So you need 33% less cells. That means less housings, less top cap, and then the you also limit the number of operations. For example, winding, electrolyte insertion, filling, and closing. In com at commercial scale, every process involves time, and time is money at that scale. So the less number of processes you have, better it is. So in terms of um, 
coding and drawing calendaring, it is still the same. You still need to make those electrodes. You still need to dry them. You still need to calendar it. But once it comes to jelly roll formation, because you can put more jelly rolls in 21700, you need, you know, you need less number of operations. You need less number of housing. You need less number of electrolyte filling stations um, per watt hours. And then you also decrease the number of formation steps. So that gives you a little, you know, cost reduction happens from the material, cost reduction happens from the production and assembly. And then you also need less number of welding points. On this, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 14, 14, 28 points to weld, right? And then you have the bus bars going from all these cells to the main battery management system. But in this case, you minimize the number of welding spots, the bus bars, the copper nickel strips that connect, or the, the, weld, the, the material that connects each cell, you minimize that. And then you also minimize associated battery management systems cost. You have, you need less number of cells to attain specific water capacity. So all of this together, put together, lead to more efficient and then, you know, inexpensive pack. And oh, that's one of the reasons, you know, if you want to make a mass market car, you need to squeeze out every possible um, cost reduction mm -hmm. step, right? So, so go ahead. You so what I hear you saying is between the 18650 and the 2170, there's not a big difference between energy density of the two, but one of, one of the things is it's, more cost effective, more cost efficient to produce the 2170 because it requires less materials and, and, and can be produced faster. That's it, that's right. Well, at least that's why, I mean, that's, that was the conclusion of the paper and that's, that makes reason, that, that makes perfect sense because Tesla chose to do go, go with 2170 for Model 3 because they want to bring the cost down. And how are they bringing the cost down? Well, they go from aluminum body frame to steel, but still they were able to bring the cost of the battery pack also down through these materials. I'm pretty sure 21700 lent lend to some of those cost production. And I wonder why they haven't moved the S and the X over if it was, if it was truly a, a constraint on cell supply or or something else. I mean, that, I guess I guess constraint supply makes sense if they're trying to put all of their energies into a, uh, a the Model Three, which has a larger potential market. Um, I wonder if they'll end up going that direction with 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 the Model S and X and any future vehicles uh, uh, in in the near future. Well, that could be a good question with the battery investor and drivetrain investor mm -hmm. day and. Um, do you do you know if Model Y is using twenty one seven hundred or eighteen six fifty? That's the assumption because the Model Three and the Model Y are supposed to share seventy five percent of the same parts. So if this is supposed to be a, a continuation of this streamline of production, you got to assume that they're going to be using the same battery packs to Absolutely. go in the Model Y as, as they're putting in the Model Three. Do you know about anything about the semis? Semis will use twenty one seven hundred or? I don't believe that they said for certain. Okay, but well, my hunch is that they're going to stick with twenty one seven hundred hundreds as they move forward to a cyber truck and then Model Y because at the, you know there's no way somebody can you know, put out a cyber truck at that price point, whereas Rivian is charging twenty five thousand dollars more if they have to do it at forty nine thousand dollars for the all wheel drive truck cyber truck. I mean, there are many other factors, battery improvements, and many other things, but. I believe they will use 2170, but I could be wrong. But I look forward to the official press release. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also found interesting, something that you may want to explore is that efficiency of Model 3 comes from the fact that they switched to silicon carbide in power, uh, in power electronics, the inverter. Basically the silicon carbide is better than previously they were using something called um, 
insulated gate bipolar transistor IGBTs, right? And uh, now they switch to MOSFET. MOSFET is basically like a switch. You have this huge power house or a battery energy source. How much of that goes to the motor is dictated by the power electronics module. And to regulate how much you go, how much you electricity you send to the motor, they use MOSFETs and they are sticking with silicon carbide. And they, apparently the silicon carbide is more efficient. There are, you know, if you go to some of these electric um, um, technology-based websites, they talk a lot about how, you know, in fact, it is, this picture is from Monroe Associates mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and p and Power. They show that, you know, this is, they have 24 of these silicon carbide MOSFETs. And they also switched to six pole permanent manual synchronous reluctance motor, uh, which has giving them a, a slightly better efficiency. And also they switched to 21700 NCSLs by Panasonic, which provides a lower cell resistance and the higher energy per cell, but the density remains a bit closer to 18650s. So I thought I would share that with you. So, uh, do we have any other discussion points mm -hmm. no. before moving to? So now, what is the path forward, right? Now we discussed about solid-state batteries. We discussed about uh, in the previous video. We discussed about how the current status, the current state of the art is. So moving forward, what could be the uh, path forward? So I thought I would include this share. This is uh, this slide is from Professor Ichwe at Stanford, and this is by this paper, Aligning Academy and Industry for Unified Battery Performance. So the way experts look at it is, right now we are at this energy density of water, if you look at water per kilogram, around 250 to 260 using lithium cobalt oxide, which is the cathode used in iPhone, and then the graphite anode. Now, if you push that to lithium rich cathodes, for example, lithium rich and nickel NMC811 or some other cathodes. And then you increase this to silicon-based anode, silicon and carbon hybrid, right? Then you're looking at about 350 to 400. There are challenges, but it, you, people have already shown three, about 300 safely. So you can push it up to 350 easily using, you know, if you can make these two work at commercial scale. But getting to 500, as we talked about, it's a long way ahead. And then you need to have sulfur, really cheap cathode, inexpensive, and you need to get the lithium metal working. To get the lithium metal working, you need to have a proper electrolyte, which is going to be mostly solid electrolyte, but that is still way um, you know, further down the line. So this is how people are looking at, and this is the metric they're looking at, right? Ideally, you want to have 500 watt hour per kilogram, cell cost of $60 per kilowatt hour, and charge cycles of 3,000 to 10,000. And ideally, I mean, this is like target, the ideal targets, to charge it of less than like 15 minutes to 10 minutes and safe. Well, this is an ideal metric. That's what everybody's aspiring for, but it's pretty challenging to get there. I mean, even if you get to 100 watt hour per hundred dollars per kilowatt hour and if you can push it to 400 that's a big achievement in itself and maintaining cycle life and then charge rate so do we need to i mean if do we need to get to the 500 watt hours per kilogram i mean it seems like 400 is is pretty great so I'm, I, I suppose that if, if if the energy density is higher then there's more applications but i can think right now tesla's got a 300 and 60 something, 370 mile uh, Model S, um, you're starting to get pretty close to parity yes. with, with internal combustion engine ranges. So once, once it hits that, that parity, is it better to have more range? Does it, is it really necessary? Or are there other things that um, are more important? Well, you're absolutely right. At that point, it wouldn't make sense to push the energy density any further but you will be looking at cost. Can we reduce the cost? So can we, so, so we can put out the Model 3 for 
can we get the can we get the cycle life to remain stable at that price point and energy density can we improve the charging i mean even if you can get 3000 cycles that's pretty great and then if you can bring the cost to 75 kilowatt 75 dollars per kilowatt hour and if you can bring the charging to 15 minutes i mean then you you can literally obliterate uh, gasoline cars in every performance metric at that point what do you know about the, this million mile battery paper that, that uh, Professor Don published in 2019? Well, the paper was basically intended to show the whole research community that, well, this is the state of the art. People were looking at outdated information to model all that stuff. And he wanted to show what the best lithium ion chemistry can do. Um, you know, um, incredible number of cycles, very resilient. And it is, it, you know, if you don't consider the cost, then you can use that. And if you don't consider these two metrics, energy density and cost, then it will absolutely power an electric car for over a million miles. But there is, for these two specific reasons, energy, energy density, low energy density, slightly low energy density, and slightly higher cost because of the cobalt content, they may not use it um, but it's still an absolutely incredible piece of work it took me two years of work two to three years of work to put it together and it is um, because the whole idea of tesla is to accelerate the the you know sustainable energy transportation right so to do that you need to bring the cost down uh, so it is it is for that reason Tesla may not use the exact chemistry, but it is a powerful hint that, you know, well, it's everything is on track and they may have um, very, in, you know, in well, fairly uh, less than $100 per kilowatt hour, but still have 3000 cycle battery in the near term, very near term. And I think they may use NMC532 for their energy storage application, not in the electric vehicle application, because for the storage, they don't really care about, um, you know, it doesn't need to be super energy dense. But for electric car, they, it does need to be energy dense. Mm -hmm. But it caught a lot of press because, you know, people are really hoping to see 1 million mile batteries soon. Uh, and you know it was it is I, and in reality it is an absolutely incredible piece of work. Um, but the exact composition of one million mile battery, uh, I don't think anybody knows. I don't know. Public doesn't know it yet. Mm -hmm. So the last few slides I want to dedicate this to. Um, now we talked about this one, right? Silicon and carbon hybrids. So there's been an um, amazing amount of work by Professor Ichoi and then many other groups around the world. So basically the idea premise is that graphite, which is carbon six, that represents the carbon six, you know, it takes, it takes six carbon atoms to host one lithium and theoretical capacity is about 370. But silicon on the other hand can host for one silicon atom, you can host 4.4 lithium, which is incredible. So the specific energy goes goes through the roof, like 4,200 milliamp hour per gram. It's almost 10 times, more than 10 times. But the problem is silicon undergoes four times 400% volume expansion too. And as a result, it breaks. So the group at Stanford has been doing amazing work since 2008. They started with nanowires, and then they start making coarser nanowire, hollow spheres, to all, all in an effort to curtail this volume expansion problem and have stable solid electrolyte interface. To have just those two solid electrolyte, stable solid electrolyte interface, and then to, 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 to eliminate this problem of volume change. So then they came up with double walled hollow, where, whereas you know you have structure like this, and then the silicon, sorry, the lithium inside can expand. The silicon inside can expand, and the the outer grayish circle that you see is the solid electrolyte interface remains stable. Then they came up with yolk shell, where it's you know, basically what you see is silicon with covered by a scaffold. It can expand 
and contract, expand and contract. But you know, none of this is done at a commercial scale. Though the, so they kept improving. Generation seven is self-healing. They could, you know, they could heal even if it cracks. The the it can heal back. Then they came up with pomegranate-like structure, um, where you know it's a it's a agglomeration of small particles which are like Yorkshire, and then they were able to do pre-liberation of silicon nanos. You know, all of this effort, right? We can go into these papers and read more. All of this in an effort to understand and um, solve the problem of, problem of volume change and then have a stable interface because. If volume changes, solid electrolyte breaks. If solid electrolyte breaks, then it leads to more consumption of lithium and then degradation of the battery. So, and finally, you know, they were able to come up with some commercial success. They came up with a company called Amprius. Basically, right now it is powering small devices like drones and other small app devices um, where they have about 290 watt per kilogram and 750 water per liter energy density. So this is all, you know, this is all an effort to commercialize what we spoke here. And that's about 10 years of worth of work, silicon and carbon. And there is a battery consortium called Battery 500 that is working on um, cathodes too. Uh, so, what, so this is another interesting thing, right? There is a company called Sila Nanotech. It is founded by two people. One is uh, Gene Berdachevsky, which who was employee number seven at Tesla, and then a professor from Georgia Tech, Professor Gleb Yushin. And they have made some interesting breakthroughs. And I think Berdachevsky truly understands the importance of, because he was involved in the development of the Roadster battery. So he truly understands that you, you need to bring the cost down. You, it has to be mass market affordable and you have to get the energy density and cycling high enough. So they were, they're working on silicon-based anodes. So they still use transition metal-based cathodes, I believe, but the anode is silicon-based. And the, the technology is you can just drop in. You can take out the existing tech, put in their stuff, and that's how they were able to, you know, con they were able to convince Daimler, and they got like in series C or D, I don't know, they got, several millions dollars worth of funding. And then recently they hired Mr. Kurt Kelty, who was a um, key figure for the growth of Tesla. He was with Tesla until 2018, I believe. And this is what he commented when he joined Scylla Nanotech. So I hope you know people can look more into this technology and, and keep an eye on the company. So he said, batteries are all about trade-offs. With Sila, you get improved energy density without all the trade-offs, said Kurt, Kurt Kelty in an interview. Let's say a Tesla car gets 200 miles per charge and 1,000 cycles. If you can get 5,000 cycles with same range, you're talking about a million mile car. I've spent 25 years working towards this. It's a natural fit for me. Now he works as a senior VP of automotive for uh, Sila Nanotech. And he was one of the key figures. He worked with Panasonic for 20, 15, 20 years. Then he, he got Tesla and Panasonic married. And then he, he was a key figure for Gigafactory expansion. So if he joins this company, that shows something, right? So I mean, I'm excited to see what Sila Nanotech brings into the market this year or early next year. And then there's Battery 500 Consortium. Uh, which comprises of uh, you know, Stanford researchers, like you know uh, Professor Ichuai and many others. Uh, this is Binghamton, which has Professor Whittingham, the Nobel laureate, UP Austin, Professor Goodenough, Tesla, IBM, Idaho National Lab. So really great team of scientists. And they put out this paper in 2019. They were able to make use of lithium metal and NMC and they were able to push the energy density to 300 watt per kilogram. They did it by keeping the electrolyte. This is this ratio is you know, um, this ratio is negative elect negative to positive electrode, and then this is electrolyte to uh, carbon uh, ratio. 
So uh, they were able to keep it within the commercial limits and still provide very decent uh, energy density. So I think the Sela Nanotech, I think there's one more slide. Yeah, that's the last slide. So there, there's a ton of work done by Battery Fiber Consortium to get the cathode, uh, the right kind of cathode. And uh, there's a lot of work on the anode side, which is silicon based anodes and lithium based anodes. This is a lithium based battery. They did make the battery. This is the paper. People can go and read more about it. And there's another company called 24M. This is uh, in partnership with Kyocera and, uh, uh, and Professor Yet Ming Chiang, who was one of the key, key scientists behind lithium iron phosphate battery. They recently released a product which is like a Tesla power wall for energy storage. Uh, they call their company uh, 24M and it is a semi-solid battery. And, um, and, 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 and that's pretty exciting. And the company Catu, the contemporary you know, technology, which makes it based out of China, which makes huge number of cells for Tesla and many other partners, they're working on these things, right? For NMC 811, 4.2 volts, 4.4 volt NMC 532 on the cathode side. On the anode side, they're working on graphite, different graphites, and then sil hybrid silicon graphite, which will push the energy density. So that concludes what I wanted to present about future, what future holds. We talked about Battery 500 Consortium, how they're working on different cathodes and lithium metal, and then Sila Nanotech, an amazing amount of work done at Stanford to, to push silicon anodes. Um, that's the path forward. I'm sure you have some insight into this. That's exciting. That's really, really exciting. The future is, is certainly bright for uh, electric vehicles. And I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about what's to come, especially in 2020. I, I do have a question for you that's really vexed me over the last several months, I wonder if you might be able to provide your opinion in any any additional insight, which is for many years, you know, Tesla has been making electric vehicles and okay. uh, up until recently, they were really the only, one of the only viable options for long range EVs. And people were saying that some of these larger automotive companies like Mercedes and Audi and BMW and Porsche would come and, and create these, what they called, or, or what the mainstream media called Tesla killers. Yes. But we've yet to see a, a product that has exceeded the 265 mile range 2013 Model S. What do you make of that? And, and why aren't EVs from traditional automotive companies more competitive. The the I remember we specifically talked about the last time we were had a discussion about the Porsche Taycan. We'd yet to we'd yet to learn the, the range. Um, that has now come out since at 201 miles. So for a hundred plus thousand dollar car with a 201 mile range. Um, I personally was was quite disappointed. It's a beautiful looking car, but was quite disappointed in that. So, what what do you make of uh, the, the the struggle that these traditional automotive companies are having to to put out a product that's equal or better to what Tesla has? Sure, I know. Since the since the day you put out that video with uh, Sandy Monroe, I've been thinking about it, and uh, he mentioned something. Right, he said. Um, some of these companies outsource some of their battery tech to outside partners, LG, whether it's LG or Cattle or, you know, whether um, CATL or and some other companies. So there are not many. Volkswagen is still thinking of Gigafactory, but they're, they're, they're yet to get it up and running. So battery is one thing. Unless you have a really robust, vertically integrated battery supply chain, you can't bring the cost down on the battery front. 
they can get the cross down on the assembly line, the body and the frame and other stuff. But batteries are one, some of the biggest expenses when it comes to an electric car. So they have not tackled it. And Tesla, I think, I don't know how they had that amazing vision. They worked on superchargers. They worked on Gigafactory. They worked on, uh, I think that goes back to their philosophy. Once Professor Don was, and Def Don was mentioning that in 2009, he met with the original founders of Tesla, Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpanen. And uh, Martin Eberhard called uh, Professor Jeff Don and then they were speaking and he showed the roadster and said, well, you know, look at this car. This has 230 mile range or something like that, 200 plus mile range. It's very fast. It's fun to drive. But the cost is, the cost is prohibitive. If you can make the same car for $35,000, nobody would purchase a gasoline car. And it stuck with me. And they all have been working towards bringing the cost down very aggressively. I read even in one of the articles that, uh, you know, Elon calls Panasonic CEO middle of the night and then calls him and then talks to him about, and then, you know, he constantly requesting Panasonic to push their cost down, but Panasonic wants to keep their margins higher. They think as Gigafactory is more established. So it's the conflict of, uh, I think, cultures. Uh, Panasonic is in the business of selling batteries. Tesla is in the, you know, the, the inherent philosophy is to push sustainable transport. Um, they're all in, they, have, they don't have plan B. They don't, they're not thinking of doing hybrid or gasoline cars. So batteries on one thing and uh, they are still, I think they still don't have the kind of vertical integration these guys have. They don't have the power electronics nailed down completely. They may have some good stuff, but they're yet to do it in a, in a much larger scale. Um, you know, if you look at some of these companies, um, they may have a team of like maybe 400, 500 people, right? But they're not like Tesla with 50,000 employees focused on one problem. Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm, this is something that I, I will continue to follow really closely because I mentioned this in, in several other videos, but if Tesla continues to be so far ahead, I wonder, I wonder if that means that some of these other automakers will, will be at a significant disadvantage, so, so much so that they become irrelevant. You know, it's the survival of the fittest, right? Um, that's how the companies survive and then they, they change. If they don't change, they will fall off the chart and then they will just, you know, they will have to, either they'll have to fold and then go, you know, do something else or they have to adapt themselves. So I think some of them, many of them will adapt, uh, but uh, you know, it's, it's amazing what Tesla has done and they're still leading the way. So it's this, this decade is going to be extremely interesting, you know, many, many changes, huge disruptions in the market. And it's not just the range that, that Superior, they're also working at the same time on, you, know, you mentioned the, the charging network, fast charging network that they offer, but it doesn't stop there. It's the software prowess. It's how well they execute on software. It's what seems to be like the beginnings of an app store inside of the car that yes. to me, it seems inevitable that they open it up to third party developers. A lot like what we saw with, with Apple and Google, how they, how they created an app store platform for developers to build apps on. And then, and then lastly, it's, it's this autonomy this, this full self-driving piece where Tesla is collecting just numerous amounts of data uh, from, from their nearly a million, a million vehicle fleet and, and analyzing the data and then, and then using that to, to iterate on their, on their software product for autonomy. So it's, it's getting really interesting. I'm, I'm, you know, inside, I'm a little bit concerned about, about, if some of these other automotive companies will survive the next five to 10 years. You know, in the recent interview, Bob Lutz turned around and said, wow, Tesla is now running like a normal business. That was a shocker for me. And it's funny that, you know, when we spoke last time, May 29th or something like that, right? 
on June 3rd or May 29th, the, the Tesla stock was at $185. When the first podcast happened, right, that week, and it was at the lowest in many years, 185 or something like that. And today we are talking again, the stock is at 470. And that shows something. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's encouraging. And I think, I think, uh, I think Tess is in a really good position. Anything could happen, of course, but they seem to be doing the right things at the right time at, at, at this moment. So, Robbie, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your insight and, and the time that it took to put this presentation together, the slides and everything. So thank you. And it's always good to talk with you. And um, I would love to hear from those who, who have taken the time to watch this hour and a half or so uh, conversation here. What are your thoughts on this? Put it in the comments down below. Uh, if you wanna hear a, a third part to this series at some point in the future, Add that in the comments too, and uh, appreciate everyone for watching. So, Robbie, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to catch up. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Sean. It's a privilege, and I'm happy to be part of this. Thanks again for the opportunity. Absolutely. We'll talk very soon. Take care.